Papers. We're going to talk language today, which is uh, which is always good. Uh, yeah, this is this is good stuff. I uh, not like that usual crap that I bring you, but language. You know what we say, how we say it, where we say it, why we say it, all of that. That's what we look at. And so, and this quote here, taken from an old textbook that I used to use and I, I, I keep it here because it is it is something to think about here in many ways language is the essence of culture right it's the the idea of culture being something that we you know pass down to future generations that we share and we've we've talked about diffusion and, and things like that a lot of that happens through language and you know, language is one of those things where, to simply say, it doesn't simply mean the English language, obviously, but it also doesn't simply mean the spoken word or even the written word or things like that. There are other ways to communicate, right? We can think of just kind of symbols and signs and stuff like that in general. Um, but it's I think it's a good starting point here. The language, culture at all connects together but when we're studying this as you know people of the academy people of science and, and all of that we call it linguistics and right? that's that's the term that effectively means the 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 academic or scientific study of language and not simply you know the, the words we use it's not like an english 101 kind of thing not to to, uh, you know, mock uh, that kind of stuff. But it, it goes even, you know, further than that. We're not studying simply, like, how to write well. Uh, we're, we're studying, like, what, just what is going on with language. And Steve, in the chapter on language that I have you guys reading, he also mentions uh, geolinguistics, from what I remember. Uh, the idea of, like, a subfield of not just looking at language, but connecting it to place and space and all that, right? Getting the where uh, addressed, putting it into that context. It will be, we'll be seeing that. Uh, so in studying this, and this is pretty much, well, this is what I said, skills pass from one generation to the next. It's, yeah, again, I, sh I never read ahead and I never remember how I set these slide things up. Apologies. Uh, but yeah, I already said that, that uh, first thing. Um, and we, the last one, the whole place names, we talked about that before, toponyms, right? What we call things that's telling, and that can be, you know, general kind of generic senses of, of history uh, and all that. But it can also, as I brought up weeks ago, uh, it's, um, you know, it's power, right? Whose culture is represented on the landscape and all that. And then in the middle here. A perception of our environment. I mean, that's one cool thing about studying language is that you can kind of you can get a sense of what's going on, of of like how a group of people perceive the environment around them. You know what's important, what isn't important, uh, how detailed they they focus on on certain things based on the words that are used. Like like have you guys heard? The whole thing, that, that did you know that the Eskimos have 472,000 words for snow? Uh, you heard that? Yeah, it's not true. Um, at all, for a variety of reasons. Number one, the, the term Eskimo, um, not the best term to use, mainly because it's been a catch-all for, like, you know, northern arctic indigenous peoples so when you say eskimo you're lumping in a bunch of folks and it's not as simple as like you know you can lump in a bunch of uh, different cultures when you say you know latino or, or latinx or or european or east asian even or, or whatever it's not just that because it's also a case of uh, uh eskimo not not the most politically correct way to use that stuff so so a that's problematic. And actually, when you look at it, um, in these indigenous languages uh, up there in the Arctic region, uh, words for snow, uh, no. Uh, not, you know, these groups don't have necessarily, um, you know, any more than we see in something like 
English. So this was a case of, and it was something like, this happened like 100 years ago, whatever. Somebody took this one study and extrapolated something, and it's kind of like the game of telephone, where that all kind of went along, and, and it's garbage. But we do see in certain languages, like the Spanish language, there are a lot of beautiful words for different topography, different relief, different types of, of hills and mountains and things like that. In English, there's a lot of uh, um, nuanced language for water, right? And it has, to, you think, English, the British Isles, it's an island, um, and had, you know, quite the uh, armada and, and navy and all that, so, so they got that going on. In Spain, there's a lot of different, you know, hilly terrain, uh, so, you know, hence the the these words uh, and this is just a i don't and you'll learn in here i i don't do well with uh espanol as uh as it's known uh I, I can't speak the language at all no matter how hard i've tried um yeah it just doesn't work it's too pretty and my my you know aggressive german mouth just can't roll r's and all that i'm really good at, at shouting harsh sounds uh, but when it comes to to beautiful rolling sounds and all, I, I can't do it at all. That's why, in fact, teaching this class online, it's one thing that one one of the things I miss is uh, uh, calling roll, and and I would you know pronounce some of your last names and even your first names horribly. Just sounds so harsh, and I say, yeah, I didn't get it right. Uh, you pronounce it for me, and then you would you know say your last name, and it would just be beautiful. It would just you know tumble. Uh, in the air there and just sound wonder I can't do it all right so Spanish uh, uh, no bueno uh, as they say but you look at a, a thing like this right here this table that we're looking at I mean just it's just fantastic these different terms right just one word um, little terms here for something like a word for a barren treeless mountain right there right in English, to describe that, you have to say a barren, treeless mountain. We don't have that. It's a mountain, right? And then maybe we'll, we'll add some adjectives or, or whatever to describe what's going on with the mountain, but we don't have stuff like this. So, yeah, language. We study the words themselves. There are going to be some interesting things in there, right, from a geographic perspective. So, that, yeah, that's cool. You know, this, you guys can access... This video. In fact, let me see. Let me see if I can make this work here. Is it gonna play? Oh, it's gonna go here. Yeah, okay, we'll 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 try this here, showing you a video within a video, and and all that. You can watch it if you click on the the Google. Um, oh, listen to that. Listen to that. Some music. Oh, and we're gonna see the language spreads comes out of Turkey. And and eventually, yes, starts to move, changing, changing colors. We're we're heading up into. Oh, look at that! Yes, yes, we've got a new language, and then the yeah, end going the other way. And ho ho! So so this is is something. This music is is so loud. My God, um, this is something that we would show. Like actually, legally, I'm supposed to teach you. This stuff, and we we continue. Oh, and it gets rid. This is uh, sexy as hell. I'll, let me, okay, let me just. All right. Okay, and it's uh, okay. Yeah, all right. Here, you know what? We're gonna. We're just okay. 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 Um. So yeah, this is something that legally I'm supposed to be teaching you and looking at uh, how languages have they they begin here and move elsewhere and blah, 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 blah. no no this this is garbage right here and this is the problem kids let me tell you this is the problem with cultural geography and linguistics and a lot of these studies and stuff that we just regurgitate and and teach you guys and you'll you know go on knowing this or regurgitate it to other people if you go into teaching or whatever. This is all crap, because what it is, so it's the idea, we have what's called the mother tongue, which is is this like, you know, at least, I mean, at least we're talking, you know, ladies, maybe that's a little feminist, um, so rock on, but it's the idea 
that we have these original, this original language, right, that starts, well, we started here at 6,000 BC. So over in, you know, modern day Turkey, we've got our mother tongue, and then it spreads out, and all of these languages are connected, right? And so, our, you know, and doesn't that make you think about how, really, we're not that different after all, if, if all of our languages are connected to this one mother tongue. Aren't we all sisters and brothers? No, no, that's complete garbage. For a few reasons, but here, number one, right, what's really garbage about this is we fixate on what's going on here and how it spreads over here, but mainly, like, yeah, you know, yeah, I say we fixate on this, like, from an academic standpoint, it's, you know, historically it's been white folks uh, who have looked at, like, okay, yeah, it goes over here. And we got some stuff going on. Isn't that sweet? Uh, but mainly we're excited to look at what's going on here in Europe. And what we don't do is we, we don't look at any of this other stuff right here, right? Over here, or over here, or whatever. And really what it implies is that uh, nobody was talking, right? Everybody was just, just quiet, just, just kind of sitting there silently, maybe waving at each other, or doing little hand signals or, or something like that. But nobody spoke. And then it was in 6,000 BC, some, some Turks, uh, you know, one of them just went like, hey, hey, what's going on? And the, and the other one went like, whoa, can we, oh yeah, we can just do this. Let's quit waving hands. Let's just start, start talking. And, and so that was cool. Uh, and then, but, but like, you know, they're doing that in Turkey, but, but you go into to Greece or Italy or Germany or, you know, the modern day spots uh, that are, are named that, and, and everybody was just, you know, clicking and grunting or whatever until this language came up here. It's the stupidest idea ever, okay? So so right off the bat, like, sure, we can see some connections between words and the roots of words and, and all that, but then here's the other thing. Who cares, right? It's this, it's a, a thing we have in some of the, the academic research, it's a fixation on origins, okay? and this is something we want to avoid. Right? It's like the idea, if we can trace these different European languages uh, and, and some of these you know, Middle Eastern, West Asian languages, uh, if we can, can trace these back to one spot, so what? Does it tell us anything? Does it get us at any answers or, or whatever? Nah, not really. Right? But it just seems like the right thing to do, to go back to day one, to go back to these origins. Okay, We don't want to do that. So here, let, let's go back here. Let's, so skip this, so that you've seen it. So legally, you can still get your three units for this, this class. Um, no, we're, we're not going to worry about this mother tongue stuff, because it doesn't matter. Here's a quote from uh, Deleuze and, and Guattari. Um, there is no mother tongue. Only a power takeover by a dominant language within a political multiplicity. Which is beautiful, what they're saying there. But basically, what they're getting at, again, it's power, right? It's how, you know, groups taking control, seizing control. It's not a case that nobody was speaking. It's that one group had power over another. They were able to impose a language, right? That's where we have these connections, but we gloss over that. We don't think about power and control and, and these kinds of relationships when we study this stuff. Instead, we look at language as just kind of some fun, like mathematical kind of deal where it's treated just kind of like, you know, data, right? Where it's just, okay, this was here and this was here. No. You know what we're going to get into? This is my kind of linguistic geography stuff right here. Stuff like this. Oh, God, this brings me such joy. I, I took this picture in a bathroom. You can see by the tiles. And of course, most of my pictures I've shared with you, I've taken in a bathroom. So this was in a men's room. I like got near Exposition Park in you know, Los Angeles, uh, near near USC. Um, so, so yeah, I go in to use a bathroom, and, and this is there. And this was years ago. No, I don't even remember when I took it, but I just saw it. Oh, bless its heart. This is fantastic. Because, so first, I don't, I don't know if I mentioned or if you guys can tell, I'm a white guy. Um, so if this, if, if this was missing that one keyword, I would take offense, 
right? But because of that most that's in here, I, I can assume um, that, that that's not me. It's not, uh, it's not referring to me. It's, uh, it's those other ones, right? So I, I kind of like that. I also like that it's missing a C in that first word. There's a lot going on here, right? But this, this is more interesting. First of all, it's funny. Um, but second of all, this is more interesting when we're studying language. Again, it's what's written, how it's written, where it's written, but it's also what's going on today. I don't care what they were saying 8,000 years ago in Turkey or whatever. Like it's interesting, you know, from like a National Geographic kind of standpoint, learning about the past, blah, 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 blah. Um, no, this is the stuff that we're going to focus on here, right? And, and, you know, and I apologize for the, uh, the language, but we're doing it for science. Um, but yeah, that, that whole idea of most in there, like why, when you're doing graffiti, and we're going to talk about graffiti now, it's a transgression, we already mentioned that before, but the fact that it's, this isn't something that somebody just typed in their computer, or wrote in a notebook or whatever, this is written in a relatively public place, and it wasn't supposed to be written there, so that's, you know, the transgression of graffiti, we'll, we'll get into that, but also the idea that you're angry, like I can just picture the guy who does this, is pissed, some white guy or, or whatever, but still can't, and I don't, you know, I don't know who actually wrote this, if it's a black guy or a, you know, East Asian guy, you know, Latino, like, well, what? Um, I assume, oh, hell, for all I know, it could be another white guy. You even think about that. How racist of me to not even assume they're going to be one of my people. Um, that's like, man, we're terrible, right? But then maybe that's why it says most, because you don't want to say, like, well, I'm cool. Right? Like, I could see myself writing this. That's, this is actually a statement I agree with um, as a white guy. So, so I could see that, right? It's not all of them, but it's most of them, right? There's just a lot going on. So this is, this is what we're getting at when we're studying language. All right? It's, it's again, what we're saying, where we're saying, how we're saying, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, here's something a little less crass. Let's talk about delicata. Does that sound nice? Do you have you eaten a delicata? Uh, what a beautiful, beautiful! It's a, it's a fish. Delicata is a fish. Uh, it's catfish. It's farm raised catfish. But way back in two thousand eight, the Catfish Institute. Did you know there was such a thing in Jackson, Mississippi? Um, they they came up with this this market tested name, meaning that they didn't just come up with it. They, you know, had a bunch of different names and tested it on these focus groups to see what sounded the best, what people responded to. And so they came up with this idea of labeling any American farm raised catfish. That's called delicata. Okay? Uh, and uh, anything else, you know, like that's imported from say Southeast Asia. There are a lot of uh, um, fish farm operations in there, right? It's the idea you're farming fish. Um, it, you, they're still in water. They could even be in a river, or, you know, some kind of natural body of water, but they're penned in. So it's kind of the way that we, you know, raise cows and pigs and chickens and stuff like that. It's That's what fish farming is, right? The problem, though, is that these uh, uh, Asian fish farmers could produce a fish for much cheaper than we can over here. Uh, and so our American catfish farmers were suffering. So rather than, you know, deal with market costs or get government subsidies or, or whatever, no, what we're going to do is something more psychological. What we're going to do is we're just going to change the name to appeal to more people. We'll sell more because, like, come on, right, catfish, that's poor people food, right? I mean, it's delicious. Don't get me wrong. I love it so bad. Um, but it's it's what the poor new people eat. It's not something fancy, right? Like, like you know, salmon or swordfish or, or something like that. Um, no, it's, it's it's poor food. You eat a bunch of it. You, just, you pull them out of the river, fry it up. And that's what you eat. So, no, instead of calling it catfish, we call it delicata. Uh, and that's just, I mean, that's just sexy as hell, right? So there's my phone that went off. Um, 
this is sexy as hell, so, so yeah, we're going to change that name. And so the idea is you're going to sell more because if you're at a restaurant and you're like, well, I could order the catfish, but what's this, this delicata? Um, you know, you're going to buy that. It's going to be fantastic. I don't think this ever went anywhere. I haven't seen it. To be honest, a lot of the stuff I see is still um, uh, produced by uh, foreign farmers. Uh, it's imported from other places. Frankly, because I think for a lot of people, when you're buying stuff, price is the, that end goal there. So it didn't quite work. But just, just that idea, right, of like what we call stuff, what we're willing to call things, um, and what we, you know, like just that mental thing. That's another key deal with language, right? And what I love, too, is you can look at that and you can say, this is the stupidest thing. I would never fall for it. Yeah, I I would. Uh, you know, maybe not this, but there's other stuff like the names of things. Incredibly important. It was uh, Shakespeare, right? Who said whatever the quote is, like a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet or something like that, right? He's he's saying, now look, it's not that it's called a rose. That's not why it's such a great thing. It's just it's you know a wonderful flower. What's in a name, right? Is is basically what they're saying. I swear to God. What's it a name? That's a that's incredibly important, right? Names are crucial. Just if you know, think about it, right? I can think of like right off the top of my head, fifty different names, other names for flowers like a rose that you could name them uh, that would make you know no one ever want to buy them, right? Most of these names I'm coming up with are way too offensive and disgusting to um, you know repeat here, but you you can play the game, right? Names matter. What we call stuff matters. And we can mock this when we look into that back region, right? Ho, ho. All right? We're looking at uh, connecting, what we talked about last time and this time and, and all that. Um, but yeah, that's the the idea here. When we see what's actually going on, when we see this market tested stuff, we can say that's stupid. But even then, we still, we still fall for this stuff, right? With brand names and stuff like that. It works. That's why people do it. So there's another thing with language. This, this is just delightful. Um, it's not just what we say, but it's like the sounds that we hear. I think this is fascinating um, where you just, we hear different stuff and, a lot, and then that's a cultural thing. So like this chart here is uh, looking at the sounds that certain animals make and then how the different languages translate this stuff. So in English, right, for dogs, it has a bow wow, right, which is, is one. Well. We could also say, you know, rough rough or woof woof or, or something like that. But any of those three options for you English speakers, I could, uh, you know, do like a cartoon. Like, right, like this Tin Tin one here, and I'm making the dog make some, some noise, and, and it could say bow wow or woof woof or whatever. And, you know, I get that's what a dog says. But look at Indonesian right here. Dogs there say gong gong. How fantastic is that? How is it great? And is it, you could say like, do, do Indonesian dogs, uh, they have different vocal cords or something? Is it a different breed? No. No, they're dogs. But the folks over there are hearing gong gong. Japanese, wan wan. That's the stupidest thing in the world. We all know it's bow wow, but they hear wan wan. And then Greek, I love this one. Gav. Gav. Just you picture a dog barking and just saying, Gav, 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 Gav. I don't know. The, the creek's ridiculous. Clearly, it's Bow Wow. Um, you say the cat thing, you know, some of this can, can kind of work. They, cats just kind of sound weird anyway, so that all works. And you, you get uh, um, birds, fantastic. Roosters, though, maybe my favorite. Uh, we all know, fellow English speakers, uh, roosters say cock a doodle doo. All right, we know that. That's what they say. Cock a doodle do. Um, but again, Indonesian, kikuri kiku. But then Japanese, koki koku And the Greeks, kikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikikik
So a few things. Accent. All right. An accent is simply a way certain vowel sounds or consonants or whatever are pronounced. All right. So we can have the same language. So we'll take in the United States, all right, for the most part, the dominant language is English. But if you go to different parts of the country, you'll still hear English. You'll hear the exact same words, but it will be pronounced differently. There'll be, you know, stresses on, on these letters or not or, you know, whatever, all right? So if we go to a place like, you know, Massachusetts, we go to Boston, we can understand what people are saying. We know the words and even, you know, the written words, you know, no big deal. Somebody says something, it sounds different. Right, that's an accent. Or you go to the South, right? A Texas drawl. That's that's an accent. Same words. These Texans are speaking the same stuff, but it just sounds differently, right? Uh, that's the idea. So that's what an accent is. In fact, what what kind of accent do we have here in California? So I'd usually be asking you guys in class, and the typical response, like some people say, like, Californian, but that doesn't count. Um, it, it doesn't work. Uh, like that because what typically is said by people in other parts of the country is that we Californians we don't have an accent right we are an accentless people think about the power right there right because to say you don't have an accent it means we speak properly right this is how you're supposed to you you hear me as a native Californian I'm here speaking this stuff I'm saying right now this is how an American is supposed to sound, right? No accent. So it means anybody in Texas or Massachusetts or Minnesota or whatever, when you hear these people talking, it sounds funny. Yeah, it's wrong, right? I mean, it's cute. We accept it. It's, it's charming. Um, but it's wrong. Californians, that's how you speak. And that's all nonsense, right? Um, because, too, you could, you know, go... Um, over to England, where where the language started, and they hear us speak, and they're like, "No, that's that's an abomination." Um, but yeah, it's a power thing, right? So something to think about there. Now, dialect is where it's you know it's still English, right? So we're here in the United States again. We're speaking English, but we have some key words that uh, change depending on where you are, right? So if you say this word instead of that word. For a, you know the same object, it's going to say something about you know from where you come, right? It's going to give like oh you grew up here. Like going back to our soda pop, Coke uh, map that we looked at, looked at right? You could see it was mapped out. Like here in California, most people call it soda. In the Midwest, most people are calling it pop. In the South, more people are calling it just Coke, right? For everything, uh, you know, Dr Pepper, Coke, Pepsi, Coke, that kind of deal there that's dialect right we still if you go to wisconsin uh and somebody offers you a pop you're not going to go like oh I, I don't understand the language no you're gonna you're gonna still be able to communicate but it's going to be a reminder that oh yeah i'm in the midwest that's why they're calling it pop and if you say eh, i'd like a soda please they're gonna go uh -huh. you're from california or like you know new england or wherever the other soda places are right that's dialect Okay, uh, now pigeon, <clears throat> this is where we're getting into, you know, actual different groups coming together and not being able to communicate, right? So you have two totally separate groups speaking different language coming together. You got to figure out how to communicate in some way. This is pre, you know, translators, Rosetta Stone, whatever uh, kind of stuff. So what we'll often form is a pigeon language, which is a, it's just a kind of blending of these two languages uh, that's really just, it's pretty basic stuff. Often um, it's got kind of like, you know, for business or commerce purposes or whatever, like for trade. Um, so you see in like Papua New Guinea, um, the language here, goodbye is goodbye. Hamas, how much? It's this blending from English sailors and the indigenous uh, folks there on the island, kind of blending together the language. And so it's not going to have, you know, big rules of, of grammar, and you're not going to be writing poetry and stuff like that. It's just like, hey, how you doing? 
hey, you know, how much do you want for this cool thing you got here? All right, see you later, right? It's going to be that kind of stuff. So as languages come together, you're going to see a pidgin language form initially. Then what might happen is you might get a Creole language forming, which is a more advanced form of pidgin, if you want to think about it. There are more words, and there can be grammatical rules and things like this. And it's kind of, it gets kind of fuzzy because we have Creole refers to uh, a few different things. Like it refers to this type of language, but it also refers to an actual language. It refers to people that it, so it can be fuzzy. Uh, and then you also have like Creole in Sierra Leone, which you can see the connection between Creole and Creole. Same kind of deal. And it's the result here, just like Creole in the, the Caribbean is, it's the result of different groups coming together. Slavery is a part of this. So Sierra Leone was this colony. It was a place for emancipated slaves to escape from, you know, white held areas, go back to West Africa to try to start fresh, right? And so you have different groups speaking different languages coming together and just really blending everything rather than deciding on one, you know, official language. We'll get into what we call that in a moment. Rather than doing that, it's meeting in the middle, right? It's blending everything together. This um, image that we have here, this is the Paternoster prayer, the Our Father who art in heaven, right? But it's written in Creole, so the language Creole. And if you look through it, I mean, right off the bat, uh, Papa, right? Our father, right? So you can see that connection there. And then you get into some stuff where, you know, if you're not, maybe if you know French, some stuff will make sense to you or whatever. But I get, for me, I look at this and it's like, I get Papa and then you get to the bottom, amen. That, that's about it uh, for me. But if you hear some of these things spoken, it can also, it can sound incredibly familiar, but uh, yeah, it doesn't quite doesn't quite make sense, right? That's that's Creole, all right? So a blend of these things. Now, the other option when you have different groups coming together is you can decide on a lingua franca, which is an official language, right? Which, uh, you know, it's really, it's saying French tongue is what this says. And it's it comes from the fact that French, the language, um, that was the official language of diplomacy, uh, so, like in Europe, you know, years and years and years ago, you'd have you'd have wars fought and and treaties, uh, you know, drawn up or agreements or whatever it might be. Everything was done in French, whether you know France was involved or not. It was just seen that that's the language of diplomacy. That's the official language. So lingua franca. Right? That's what we're dealing with now. Today, we've got, well, two examples here. We've got Swahili. That is the lingua franca of sub-Saharan Africa with the idea that you have some folk who, you know, you grow up speaking Swahili. So we, we see that in the blue here. Uh, but if you travel anywhere, you know, along the continent, uh, you're going to have your, whatever your native tongue is, the language you grow up speaking, and then you're also going to learn Swahili so that if you, you know, you're in a different country, you're interacting with other people, you converse in Swahili. So everybody knows that just so you can communicate, right? Whether you know a lot of it or, or not a lot or whatever. That's just the official language of travel around here. English is the lingua franca of the internet, really. Uh, you know, just computer technology in general. And that doesn't mean you can't pull up a website, you know, in French or Spanish or Swahili or whatever. Um, but it's, if you really look at like the underlying code, uh, if you're looking at just, you know, some of this, this, I used to have stuff I pulled up. We don't need to worry about it here, but it's just English. It's kind of this official language because the internet started here, right? And then spread out around the world. And so just by default, Stuff initially started out in English, so it's that lingua franca. Okay, so official language. That's what we're talking about.
All right, there, there are some good terms. There are some good quizzable, testable terms in there. Now let's move on to some good stuff. Let's get into what's really going on with language. And here's some fun facts. So 10,000 years ago, roughly, on the planet, we had about 15,000 languages. Okay? By the year 2100, we'll have about 300 languages left. Right, so we see we've definitely reduced language uh, here, and this is if we were in class, uh, we'd be talking about like, is this, like, is this a sad thing? You know, is this a problem? Like, what's going on? And and uh, really, what we would work toward is the idea that, of course, there are fifteen thousand languages ten thousand years ago. We're going back to, we say something like ten thousand years ago. We're going back to the beginnings of human civilization as we think of it. So humans were a little over 200,000 years old, but in that first roughly 190,000 years of our existence, um, we're, you know, we're, we're simple, right? That's, that's the cave people uh, kind of stuff. Like, the, you know, this handsome couple that you're looking at right now. But, but 10,000 years ago, agriculture, is developed, you know, big settlements, permanent settlements are developed, cities, um, you know, things like that. So we start to really, we mark a lot of human civilization from that point to, you know, present day. But the, you look at the population, and not a lot of people existed at that point in time. So you have these different civilizations here and there. You still have quite primitive uh, you know, by comparison, settlements elsewhere, um, but people are spread out. So the language you use, it's whatever, you know, your ancestors came up with to, you know, call, you know, rocks, trees, water, you know, stuff like that, other people, uh, and all that. Language was just, it was what your small little group of people, uh, you know, used, right? But then, as populations grow, people start exploring more and all of that. You have more interactions. And so, of course, we can't maintain 15,000 different languages and be able to communicate. We have pidgin languages form, creole languages form, right? Or just flat out, you know, lingua franca stuff and hostile takeovers. So some of these languages go away because those people go away because some other group of people eradicated them. Right to take their land or you know whatever the case might be. So of course, as humans grow, we need to communicate. Grow in you know numbers. You know we're at about seven and a half billion people uh, currently. That's a lot of people. We learn the same language. Right? It's just it's what we do. We just to make life easier. But we also we still have we maintain different ones. We haven't gotten to one language, but that's that's what, what's going on here. But at the same time, why not just do one language, right? Like, I don't I mean, I already admitted, I don't know the Spanish. I don't really, you know what I'm good at? I'm good at English. Dedicated my whole life to getting good at that. I, I've tried some other languages, and, and so yeah, Spanish, Lord knows I've tried, doesn't quite work. Uh, a little more success with, with French. Um, it, it was Russian, which I don't know any more, like anything except for like two or three words. Um, but that one, I, when I tried to learn that, that was really good. Uh, with a German, it was pretty good because, you know, my, my tongue, it, it felt, you know, proper um, when it was shouting uh, harsh sounds and, and all that. Um, so some of these I have some problems, but I also, I don't speak it, right? I used to speak with my grandmother in German back when I was learning it in high school. And that was you know, okay, but but uh, she's not around uh, anymore. It's, it's okay, it happens. Uh, so I mean, I don't talk to anybody uh, in German or Russian. I don't. I used to have a Russian barber. You see me? I don't have a barber. Period uh, anymore. So I don't need to speak Russian. Like it just. It, I don't need it. I'm really good at English. People. What I'm trying to say is, let's get rid of this whole 300 languages left by the year 2100. No, let's get down to one, shall we? And let's just have one. Like, wouldn't that be easy for this globalized planet? If we all spoke the same language, life would be so much easier. So how are we going to do How are we going to de decide? What we could do is we could look at 
native speakers. Now, the numbers are a little out of it. These are about 20 years old, but it still works um, for what we're dealing with here. Uh, so we could just look at, like, you know, what's the most widely spoken language, and then we'll just do that. So the first one, Mandarin Chinese. <sighs> Have you ever tried Chinese? Non-Chinese people? No, that's way too hard. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But no. Then the next one, we've got Hindi slash Urdu, which is kind of, you know, an interesting thing to lump two together. But still, no, that's that's not going to work. No, so we're going to, you know, forget that. Then we, we've got Spanish would be number three, huh? No, Spanish is too hard for me. I'm sorry, we're not going to do it. And then we have English at four. That, you know what, number four, that's good enough for me. Let's go with English, right? Let's do it. And then I don't even, I haven't even read past English. I have no idea what's at the bottom of this. Uh, I just know that English, we got plenty of people speaking it. Let's do it, right? We, we could do that. Now, I can, I can tell. I can sense it. You got you hearing this, especially those of you who speak other languages. Uh, and, you know, like you speak, you know, Hindi or, or Spanish or, or Mandarin or whatever. And you're like, no. No, I guess if you speak Spanish, you could say, no, uh, I don't know what you say if you speak Mandarin. I know Ni Hao. That's, um, that's it. Uh, but so you could say that. Okay, okay, all right, all right. Well, well, okay, how about instead we just come up with a lingua franca, all right? Why don't we do something like that? Well, let's not do any of this stuff because, again, some of these are so hard. Let's just make up a new one, right, which is what this is. It's called Esperanto. Don't know if you've heard of it before, but it's an invented language in the sense that it didn't arise from some original culture. It was something, and I believe I believe it was a Russian dude who came up with it, you know, years ago, like over a century ago, if not longer. I came up with it with the idea that yeah, we all go on and we learn our native languages, but we also learn Esperanto. So whether I go to China or to Russia, or to Mexico, or to Portugal, or, you know, wherever. Yeah, I'm not going to, I don't know Portuguese. I'm not going to be able to chat in that language. But if we all know Esperanto, we get along, right? And because this thing was invented, because it was designed to be this way, it is supposed to be super easy for everybody to learn. Like, you think... You know, with English, you've got all these ridiculous, um, you know, uh, spellings and, and rules and, and stuff like that, where it's just, oh, it's so hard to keep track uh, of a lot of this stuff. Or I'm pretty sure, like, the gender thing. That always confuses the, the heck out of me when learning other languages and the, the having genders, whether it's an O or an A at the end of a word, or or having, like, in German, they have the prefix that... that indicates the gender and all I think this gets rid of that it's just it's supposed to be pretty simple so that people can do it um yeah I've looked at this this is garbage uh, you can go online you can try to learn it it doesn't work for me and again I think a lot of it is just my brain and other languages it's not my thing I've known people who get so excited and they you know they they learn a billion different languages and it just it just works and they get excited about it doesn't work for me. So when I went to the Esperanto website to try to learn this stuff, it just doesn't click. But there are, there are millions of people who speak this, have learned it. Um, I don't know if any Americans do it, um, but yeah, it's out there. In fact, there's even, you, are you aware of this? There's even a movie made in Esperanto from a while back. I'm not going to play it here. You can link to it through the slides, or you can just... Uh, Go to YouTube if you're really interested. It's called Incubus, and it's about like vampire zombie hot chicks that seduce William Shatner or something. I haven't I haven't gotten through like more than three minutes uh, of it, but I mean just it's just that alone, right? Zombie hot chick vampire ladies and and Captain Kirk. I mean that's that's good stuff. But you can play it and you can hear the language spoken. And some stuff will sound familiar and some stuff won't. It kind of has that Creole vibe to it. But yeah, that Esperanto didn't work. Look, guys, I'm sorry. I tried to work with you, but no. You know what we're going to do? We're going to make it English and English only. We're going to get rid of the other ones. Because English, it's out there, baby. Right? And, and, you know, we'd like to say, yeah, because America, USA, 
and all that really it's the British. The reason why English is so prolific around the world is because of the British Empire, right? I mean, you think of of England itself. Uh, that is a tiny, tiny little group of people, right? So that's a, a teeny tiny little language that grew as the English, you know, went to war and took over and, and consolidated power with the rest of the British Isles and then became this bigger empire that crossed seas and took over. Like, at, at their height, the British Empire owned a quarter of the world, which is amazing. So we have, you know, we have tons of people in India, and we just saw the thing with the whole Hindi, Urdu, uh, there are a bunch of different languages, like, you know, indigenous languages spoke in India, but a lot of the folks there also, they speak English because of the years and years of British dominance, right? And have held on to that. And we'll talk about globalization later, but it's allowed India to do business with not just Britain, but us here in the U.S. And they've been able to do well with globalization because they already had the language. So they've held on to this colonial legacy in order to continue to be successful with international commerce, right? Now here, in this country, like the only reason we speak English here is because of the original 13 colonies and they were colonies of Britain, right? And that those are the folks who revolted and those are the folks who, you know, took over most of the continent and, and all that. So that's why English is here. Although we don't really have, like English isn't, it's not in the constitution, that English is the official language, like the Constitution is written in English, but we don't have any federal law that says that you must speak English. Now, you have guys like this charming fellow. I forget, I think this was like in Pennsylvania or something. This was years and years ago um, with a, a kind of racism that seems quaint uh, by today's standards. But this guy, he was like at a diner or owned a diner, and he had these stickers. I think this is the guy, not just a customer. I don't know. I forget. It's been so long. But, like, at a diner, they had a rule where if you were speaking anything other than English, you got your ass kicked out of there, and they had these stickers, you know, right there. This is America. One ordering, speak English. And I love that the, the eagle is there. Like, eagles can't speak English. That doesn't really make sense. I don't think they can. I've never tried to speak to them. But, yeah, this was all they made the... The news, like, isn't this scandalous and got people talking about this stuff? But so you have people like this who get really hung up on it. But at the same time, uh, doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily make sense, right? And, and it, we also, like I said, we don't have a federal law in place, but some states have decided, you know what? You know what we're doing? English only, baby. That's the way to go. Uh, here's a map showing this. Do you know California? We have our own English only law? Yeah, check us out. Way to go. And this is just I think it's fascinating to look at because we like to think that like California, we're hey, we're progressive. We're the, you know, left coast, all that kind of stuff. Why would we have it, right? No, in the in the eighties, um, you know, when this was passed, we oh, didn't like the Mexicans and um, like we do now, right? Um, but no, in the eighties, there's a lot of that anti, uh, um, you know, Latin American immigration sentiment there, and that's the eighties. I mean, you can go back. The the very first immigration law in this country was here in California, and it was to keep Chinese people out. Like we we do racism really good in California, but we like to make it look like we don't. Right, so yeah, we've got it, but like a place like Texas, they don't have one. That seems shocking. Uh, and you look like Louisiana. Theirs was actually in 1811. Were they were they fighting with Mexicans that that far back? No, that's a French thing, right? That's the whole Louisiana Purchase and all that. It's like like enough with this French talk. Um, you know, deal with the Cajuns and and so on. We're we're speaking English, right? Even though they maintain a lot of French laws and stuff there in Louisiana. So that's, so this is just fascinating to look at. And even, even though, uh, I was really pushing for English as the only language anybody ever speaks. Uh, that's really, that's just selfish on my part because I don't want to learn anything new. Um, or I just want all of you who don't speak English to learn English and you know, that it's the American way. Um, but honestly, the whole idea of, of forcing people to speak English is the most 
bizarre thing in the world. And like our law that we have here, it has to do with, because if you think like California is an English only law, if you looked around California, it's not like we have people only speaking English, right? You go into the DMV and you see multiple things printed in different languages and all that. The law, as it was written, it had to do with bilingual education, right? It was a way to get rid of it. So the idea that if you're, you're a kindergartner, right? Picture a five-year-old who's coming into school, to a public elementary school. You're learning English, and that's that. And if you don't speak any English, tough. You sit your little five-year-old bottom in that chair, and you just let that teacher talk to you in with those weird sounds that you don't understand. And eventually, by damn, you're going to learn English, and you're going to love America, and uh, you know, and, and you're going to start eating normal food, not that tortilla stuff. Like I don't know. I don't know what the logic is. Now, some people have fought this, like. Here, yeah, this was back in 2014. Uh, there was a push to get rid of the English only law. And I honestly don't know if we got rid of it or not. I can't remember if it, if it happened or not. It, it might have. In fact, now this is bugging me. I'm going to, hold on, let's, let's learn together. Let, let's do it. Let's see if we actually got rid of it. Because that's some homework I, I always mean to do, but I forget to do it. I only remember when I'm talking about this with, with students. Um, let's do California. I'm on another computer here. Uh, English only law. Uh, I don't know. This is no. This isn't helping me at all. Oh, we did get rid of it. Did we get rid of it? Yeah, it was in 2016. Yes, okay, no, yeah, right, so we did. That looks legit. Did we vote on that? Okay, it was Prop 58. I don't remember, that was, that was a lot. Oh, because it, it was in 2016. There were other races going on in 2016 that we were paying more attention to, but look at that, how about that? Okay, so we, we got rid of it, so, so we're cool now. But this, okay, but here's the deal. So maybe we need to update these slides. Um, but it was the idea that finally, like in 2014, this is this is brought up, finally voted on in 2016. People like this whole bilingual education kind of stuff, this is ridiculous, right? What's going on? And and honestly, what I think is most fascinating is not like the information in this article right here, but it was, see where it says four comments? That's the kind of stuff I love. Oh, comments on the internet are just... Wow, just just a nectar of the gods. They're, they're fantastic. So based on, on this article, the comments like from Kevin Imus, right here, uh, 200 languages spoken in California. Do we really need to open that can of worms? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, I guess it's the thought that we have 200 languages, but which I don't I don't know the stats. On that, that seems high. I could be wrong. I, I, I don't know. But it's the thought that we're going to have, like, in one kindergarten class, you're going to have 200 students, number one. Uh, and they're all going to speak a different language. And that poor teacher is going to be confused? Yeah, I don't know. Um, okay, so there's that. But, Kevin, I mean, that's that's weird. Um, there, I'm more of a Craig man, right? Look what Craig has to say. No effing way. Right? I love that because, A... He cleans it up, so I'm not offended. So that's good. But Craig also tells you what's going on. No, we're not going to teach five-year-olds how to speak and help them get educated. That's ridiculous. Uh, sociopathic, that's a cute one, says, uh, he says, I mean, I could say it's gender neutral. No, that's a, these are all guys. You know they're all guys because this is what guys do. Uh, if a person or their parents want to learn a different language, then they can pay for a tutor, buy a book, Go purchase Rosetta Stone software, but English should remain the primary focus within the schools, <laughs> right? So first off, like, if you want to learn something, learn it outside of school, not in the school. That's cute. But I also, again, love the idea. All right, five-year-old. All right, you want to learn English so bad? Go buy that $300 Rosetta Stone software. Yeah, hit the books on the weekend so when you get to kindergarten uh, you say red instead of rojo or whatever it is you your people say like what Ugh. 
Yeah, most students don't need bilingual education except to learn English, their second language. Trolling for votes, Senator. <laughs> That's what Gast had to say. And so, again, the idea of not needing bilingual education, that's that's fascinating all right it's like you know if you already speak english you don't need to learn another language right because usa number one i guess i don't because you're never gonna go look here's my deal yeah i've admitted i can't speak another language well i just said rojo for crying i know it's uh, the j works but yeah you know what i'm saying like i don't know it you know why like what i blame it well a you know very white, bland parents, uh, you know, were born in, in this country uh, and all that. So, you know, I mean, that, that right off the bat, you know, I don't have that cool parent who speaks another language who, who forced me to learn. So then I, I know it. I'm always jealous of you guys who have that. Um, but, but two, I didn't start learning another language until high school when my brain was shot, right? I can't imagine if in kindergarten or even preschool, if there was like a serious dedicated effort to learn Spanish. Oh my God, I'd be rolling R's. I'd be fantastic by now. It would be so useful. And like, honestly, knowing Spanish, way more useful than most of the math that I've been taught uh, growing up, right? Like that would, Spanish would have actually helped me. The only math I've ever, I think I've ever used is the Pythagorean theorem. That felt kind of cool to, to make that work out in the field years ago um but but other than that um no but being able to speak spanish out in the field at different job sites you know all sorts of stuff uh, that i've worked in would have been great but everybody here is like nope english only mofo that's what that's what we're into that's what we do that's ridiculous and it fascinates me that people are so fixated on this and i i'm saying this I don't know who I'm saying this to. Maybe you're like, what's your problem, communist? Uh, as you hear me saying this, maybe you're all, you know, English all the way, USA. Great. If that's you, bless your heart. Maybe we can talk and you can explain to me why you're so freaked out by this. Um, but for others too, I mean, my God, I teach at ABC. I, I you know, I know who I'm talking to. Uh, a lot of people who, you know, had some, some bilingual education needs growing up. And all that, but for me, yeah, being being white as can be, uh, and, and my wife is white as can be. I mean, she's she's Jewish, you know. Like that's that's the you know. Look how progressive I am. Yeah, I married a Jew. Look how yeah, I'm I'm the man. Um, yeah, she's she's white. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> she is. We celebrate Hanukkah. That's about it. Uh, so and and the kids, white as the driven snow. I mean, you know, so pretty bland um right there uh but like we've had encounters here in the antelope valley with other parents and and people who um you know just just uh, uh they don't like the spanish right my daughter she, she's much older now but, but back when when she was in preschool she was going through a dora phase love me the dora except i hate the dora too because it's all uh audible right they need to write the words down because I don't first I can't you can't speak it to me and I'm gonna pick up on like is that a you know an R or a J or you know what it doesn't work same thing with my daughter bless her heart she would get really excited when Dora would say like say whatever uh, and she would shout it and it just it sounded kind of racist when she would say it <laughs> like she's she's mocking the Spanish speaking people because it just didn't it didn't sound like Dora at all it's not what Dora said um, she was probably saying some horrible slur or swear or some way, but we didn't have letters up there. So Dora, write the damn words, uh, is, is what I'm saying. But still, she would love it. And so every time we would leave the house, uh, my little girl, Zoe, would say, uh, Vamanos, right? And that, that was our thing, Vamanos! And we can get to the car to go wherever. We're going to preschool, Vamanos! And she had her Dora backpack that she wore, and, and my wife took her uh, this one day to preschool and, and got there at the same time another mom. And her little kid got there, and they both had Dora backpacks. And so my wife mentioned, oh, Dora backpack, you know, a little parent small talk stuff. Uh, and my wife explained, like, yeah, when we left here, we we had to say vamanos as we leave the house. And the other mom, swear to God, uh, said, oh, yeah, we don't, we don't talk like that in our house. 
And another white lady. I, I should should mention the there, right there. And my wife said, "Oh, okay," and like took a giant step uh, away from this woman and never spoke to her again. And we felt really sorry for this little kid who's growing up in a Nazi compound or whatever. Like, what? What is that? Right? What is? But that's that's there's power in there, right? There's something in there, and I don't have a good answer. Like, and this is why. But this it just fascinates me. How like you know I'm just gonna lump it as white folks, but you, you don't have to be white to to have this issue. But like are so, at, and of course it's not all white folks. You know, like for my family, we're, we're you know would love to to get our kids learning this stuff, but it ain't happening. Um, but but it's the idea of like what what is this push to not have a language other than English spoken? Right? What's the problem with it? Why do we want to keep our kids ignorant of it? Um, you know, all, all sorts of... It's like the forcing your kids to remain ignorant fascinates me. But it doesn't... It's not just knowledge. There's a racial, ideological component in there, I'm sure. Uh, but it's something fun to think about. Right? So, okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm saying, hey, let's just do English... Let's uh, do that, because that's just for me. To be perfectly honest, I'm going to be dead soon. Anyway, I've had a good run. It's not like I've got some disease. I'm just an old man. I don't have much longer. You know, what I'm all for is let's do much more of this bilingual education. Um, not only to help poor little five-year-old. I still can't get over that image. Like some little you know, five-year-old child just so confused in a classroom because it's just the teacher is you know adamantly only speaking english and you know forcing this kid to learn uh but it's also like let's let's not just do that let's teach the whole class spanish or tagalog or you know like whatever language is you know in question there like let's let's educate our kids right go go figure so that all right pep talk over that's the thing um yeah, yeah, let's let's skip this. I'm all I'm I'm all worked up, right? Because uh, you know, because I've been been talking race and Dora. Um, all right, let's so we'll we'll skip that uh, stuff there. Uh, slang. Oh, let's skip that. I'm I'm exhausted. You guys have heard enough of this stuff. And the Spanglish. I love me the Spanglish. Um. But and then this gets in. I guess since we're, we've been talking, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, Spanglish is a thing. In fact, one book I used to use in this class said that Spanglish is slang. Uh, it's not. Um, it's not at all. Uh, it's what we call code switching. Okay, so code switching is this term that refers to using different languages. Just to keep it real simple here, different languages when when, when your identity shifts. Okay, so something like Spanglish, the idea that you sometimes speak in Spanish, sometimes in English, it's it's a case of coming from two different worlds, right? Typically, it's the idea that parents immigrating uh, from Latin America, and so you know have you know their native Spanish speakers, and then the child uh, you know Spanish at home, but has to learn English. You know, because they're Californians and they were yelled at uh, in kindergarten, I guess, or, or whatever. Um, but, but it's the idea that you know both languages and you go back and forth. And some words just make more sense to you in Spanish and others make more sense in English, right? That's the idea. This is more fun. I'm not going to go through. This is more fun in a classroom when I read uh, Spanglish uh, beer ads and, and stuff like that and, and have you guys... Uh, actually translate for me and actually pronounce it properly. But it's just, it's the idea that like this is in marketing and it's it's playing into, you know, identity and place and, and all sorts of stuff to sell Bud Light. Uh, and these are everywhere. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll skip this. This is good. This is off Sierra Highway. You can usually, if you're ever driving on Sierra Highway, look for me. If you see a Spanglish uh, billboard, I'm off to the side taking a picture of the thing, trying not to get hit. Uh, but yeah, it's just it's this kind of stuff. You know, who are they marketing this to, and why do some of these have more Spanish than English, and others, I like this one here, have more English than Spanish? Right? There's clearly there's a target audience 
that they're going for uh, with this stuff. So that this really isn't fun unless you can hear me slaughter the uh, the language itself and have you guys fix me. So we'll we'll move on from that. Uh, okay, this is another thing we would do in class, and it'd be a magical learning thing. Oh, let's skip it. Um, we'll finish up with this. We'll finish up with some good old graffiti. Because we've talked about it before, and this is, I mean, this is language, right? Again, not just what we're saying, but where we're saying it, how we're saying it, that, that kind of stuff. So, typically, with graffiti, in fact, I think, I think what this came from was the same book I had that called Spanglish slang, like it was just, you know, Spanish-speaking American kids just, um, you know, instead of wanting to call, you know, stuff by like cool or groovy or whatever, just started using Spanish words. No. I think it said the same thing, like graffiti is used to mark gang territory, um, which, yes, that, that can be the case, definitely, but it definitely didn't start that way in the current form that uh, graffiti is taken. And it's also, it's not the only thing that can be done with graffiti, right? Certain messages can be conveyed and they can be powerful messages if done well, right? So that's, that's something to think about. When we're looking at uh, language, when we're studying language, let's look at that, where is it at? And so the deal with graffiti course is that it's this it's a transgression okay it's the idea transgression meaning you're doing something naughty right you're doing something you shouldn't be doing okay graffiti works and i went over this like in the very first lecture where we see the image of the whatever graffiti that i cropped and then i i pull out and it's the whole it's the fancy million dollar loft in new york city right not quite the same deal it's a transgression in that you're putting up art or words or some kind of language, some kind of symbol, something like that, uh, in a place where you're not supposed to do it. That's what gives it power, right? That's what makes it a powerful thing. And now, really, we can point to this guy, Tim Cresswell, a geographer, did an article uh, on this. Um, he points to New York, specifically the South Bronx, back in the 1970s, is where graffiti as we know it today starts. Okay? And it has to, it's this Taki 183 thing. This shows up in New York, right? uh, just everywhere. So just that T-A-K-I, I think it's Taki or Tacky or whatever. And then this number, 183. What does it mean? I don't know. Um, I don't know if, if Cresswell, when he's writing about this, he would have, I can't remember. It's been a while. But it's the idea this shows up everywhere and then and it shows like this picture here we've got this guy right here white looking guy uh in here this is not the original guy or this is not really the original it, it was black folks i'm thinking we can be safe in saying started this because everything in the south bronx it was graffiti but it was also rap it was uh, just the hip-hop culture in general it was break dancing stuff like that it shows up there and then diffuses out, right? Um, so most likely, it's not really some, you know, white guy that's doing this. Most likely, I would think it's it's someone, you know, actually from the South Bronx. Um, but it, it it's not just there. It gets into the subway. And so stuff is sprayed all over the subway. And it's not just this one. It's a bunch of different, like, names and numbers and, and all of that. And it shows up everywhere. And there's a real debate in New York City. Is this folk art? Is this something kind of exciting? And you're like, what is going on? It's kind of this, this uh, mystery uh, going on. But then other people are saying it's a disease. It's a plague. It's some awful thing. And so there's a real push to get rid of graffiti, to not allow it, to clean it up, and, uh, and so on. Okay? Um, now, one... Interesting thing is that it eventually it becomes accepted. It be not by everybody, but it becomes like it becomes art in the actual art scene. And you get this the United Graffiti Artists. So people who are doing this on the streets, they, they keep doing it and they start to sell their paintings, 
right? Like you would sell a painting in a, you know, a museum for, you know, over a thousand bucks. Like it becomes part of the art establishment. And this quote from somebody, I, this is really sloppy. I don't have all the, the you know, citation stuff in here, but when some art dude in New York is, is referring to it as the visual bonus of a subway token. It's the idea, like where else in the world? And you just buy that, you know, passage onto a subway car, the dollar, you know, whatever it is to, to take the ride. You, you buy that token, yeah, you get in there, and not only are you getting from point A to point B, but you're doing it in a gallery, right? In a museum, if you want to think of it that way. You have all of this beautiful, beautiful stuff around you. Now, I mean, that, I mean, yeah, I'm not an art guy um, in that sense, but it's kind of fascinating, right? And we get actual, we have like celebrities from this um people who who you know start out on the streets doing graffiti and then become actual mainstream pop artists right you've probably seen keith herring's work uh basquiat's uh work maybe you've seen he's the guy in the upper right there and in fact this this lower left image this was some apartment in new york where he lived uh and he spray painted all over the uh, apartment um, and the, you know, the landlord, like when, when he left or when he died, I don't know the full detail, but when, you know, he moves out for whatever reason, they put a, a instead of like even repainting over it, they, they put a new wall over it. And I don't know if they were remodeling or if they just thought, oh, this is not worth the paint. I don't know what happened, but when it was being sold and renovated, this got, the wall, the, that new wall got pulled off and they discovered this graffiti and figured out who it was. And this suddenly became this valuable, valuable piece of art history. And you can look at that. I mean, I, to be honest, um, I look at that. And if I moved in, I would paint over it um, without even thinking to look to see who did it or whatever. But, you know, for others, that's an exciting thing. And it's, just, it's interesting to see how these boundaries can change and how stuff can be outside of the mainstream and accepted and all that and a big way in which this the the, the idea of what these boundaries are of what it, what's okay to do and not do is graffiti bad or good or, or whatever a lot of that's played out in the media in new york at this time where you've got in the new york times interestingly uh they're they're referring to it as as folk art like it's exciting and, and something we need to study more. Uh, and then the New York Daily News is referring to it as a plague. Right? It's the idea that it's a disease that's spreading and it's showing disorder. And this needs to get get caught uh, you know, or dealt with so that we don't see it anymore. And then today, you, know, you can look around L.A. Um, and even the Antelope Valley, like graffiti is around. And it's something we spend a lot of money in L.A. County on anti-graffiti programs to paint over stuff and, and uh, all of that. But it's interesting, right? It's, it's the money that we're using, and yet people continue to do that. And so what message is being shared there when this stuff continues to get put up, right? Even though you're not supposed to and, and all that. Is it simply gang territory kind of stuff, or is there something else at work. And so it's also a case of seeing what's actually put up can be interesting, right? Um, you know, like this, I just stole this off the internet. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, you got Jesus, you got Gandhi, you got MLK Jr. right there. And it says violence solves problems underneath that you can read that. There are a few different levels to which we can take this and, and think about stuff, think about how these three individuals met their ends and, and all that. That's what we're dealing with there. But it's, again, it's that idea of not just saying it, but of the fact that, you know, where it is. And you've got like the, the Banksy style stuff that can be, you know, interesting to look at. It's kind of clever and, and all that. But again, it's the where that we need to think about. And just, you know, not just with the graffiti, but we'll end with this one. Um, you know, the the message itself, right, to, to see how that where 
can can play a big role. Um, well, I think this is a good example right here. So the whole free Tibet movement, which back in the 90s, that was the thing, kids, let me tell you. And it was only because the Beastie Boys were behind it. Uh, and if you were cool, um, you liked the Beastie Boys. And, and if, you, you know, you liked the Beastie, you wanted to be like them, so you'd get the free Tibet sticker for your car, the patch for your backpack or whatever. And you never, I, mean, I never really knew at the time when I was in high school, like why we needed to free Tibet or like what was going on with it. But I, you know, I knew it looked cool, you know, and it might score some chicks and all. I never actually bought one of these because I, I don't think I ever saw one for sale. Um, but I would have, and I would have put it on my car and, and all that because it was, you know, total chick magnet. But honestly, it's the idea of just slapping a sticker on your car. It's like the least amount of effort possible for anything. So you can put that message up there. And as you're stuck in traffic, you might read something like, oh, free Tibet, that's interesting. And that's about it, right? And, and the idea with free Tibet, it's, it's the idea that China um, itself has, you know, spread. You've, you've looked at a map, you've seen how big the country of China is. Uh, and there are other places, Tibet included, that are within Chinese boundaries. And it's the argument that Tibet should be an independent nation, not something controlled by China. It's like, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to that as I'm recording this. The new Mulan movie with, with Disney came out and, and uh, people are mad because of where it was filmed in this area where the Uyghur population is under oppression. These ethnic Muslims in parts of Western China, right? That, it's that kind of stuff that's going on. Seeing China as an empire that's spread out. And we in this country... We love to go like, oh, come on, China, that's not cool. Ooh. In fact, again, as I'm recording this, China is, is becoming the thing that everybody's really against. The, that's the, the real problem. You, you hear both Joe Biden and Donald Trump, you know, ramping up the stuff about China and how bad they are. We're an empire. Um, we've done the same stuff, but it's way cooler to say free Tibet instead of free American Samoa, um, you know, or whatever, um, Puerto Rico, right? But anyway, so you can put it on the car, or if these images, this is the Golden Gate Bridge, um, from back, it was the 2008 Summer Olympics that were held in Beijing, as the Olympic torch is, you know, going around the world, that whole deal, um, some climbers climbed up the Golden Gate Bridge to put this free Tibet message up there now that that was something because not only were they arrested right but just the effort the danger involved and all that to get that message up there right so once again it's not just what we're saying but it's where we're saying it where we're putting those words how does that add to the message how does that change the message right and that's the whole geography thing all right, folks, there you go. We, we talked about some language stuff next time. I don't even know what I'm going to be yakking about. But, uh, you know, have a lovely day. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you later.